This episode is about owning the value that you bring to the relationship with your horse. And I'm also going to talk about how professionals in the horse business need to own the value that they bring to their clients. So most professionals know what they do, but not what they really do. So this is going to be one of those pods that's about horses and it's about life, but really how can you separate the two? So if you've ever felt like the reason you aren't reaching your goals is because you're not good enough, I think you're going to really enjoy this episode, or at least I hope you will. So here we go. Episode 26, Buck Tradition, Be More You. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Who we are and how we relate to others is reflected in our horsemanship. It can't not be that way. And in, in order to progress with our horses, we really need to be in relationship with them. We need to have a healthy relationship. And so much of that relationship with our horses is around feel, right? It's about how we feel when we're there, you know, what mood are we in? It's about how the horse feels, what mood are they in? <laughs> and it's about how our horses feel to us and how we feel to them. And teaching feel can be a real challenge, but learning to feel is actually easier than you might think. It's more about getting out of our own way, right? Because we are feeling stuff. The feelings are there. Just sometimes we block them or we're not paying attention to them the way we could. So in my program and anything I do, I always teach students to trust their instincts. That's something I say a lot, trust your instincts. And I have a saying that in order to have real clarity, you need to have a mind free of judgment, a body free of brace, and a heart that's open. All of those things I just mentioned, judgment, brace, a closed heart, you know, those are things that are getting in the way. So when you're free of judgment, free of brace, and open in your heart, that's not something you need to add on. It's about getting those things out of the way, right? So we were born without judgment. We were born without brace and we're born with an open heart. That's authenticity, right? So we're, we're already born that way. And then life, you know, happens. So when you don't have judgment, or brace, or closed, protected heart. That's when you're free to feel. That's when emotions flow. They don't get stuck. They don't have to go through our brains where we analyze them <laughs> over and over and over and over again. <laughs> so in this place of non-judgment and lack of brace and openness, this is where we all do our best work. And it's where our horses enjoy us. So being a good horseman is really about being more you. The trouble is we humans in our society often are practicing trying to fit to someone else's expectations, someone else's definitions, someone else's rules, someone else's standards. 
And so that moment that we don't feel good enough, when that little thought, <laughs> you know, pops in our brain, even just the little one, we start to doubt ourselves. We can't not doubt ourselves as soon as we think that. And that doubt is what creates a barrier between us and our horses. And I'm saying us because it's not like I've mastered this. Now, I've put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> I've come a long way, but this is not a one and done. This is a constant awareness and a constant practice. So I don't mean to be preaching here. All I know is that I have learned through life that this is important stuff and it's ongoing. And I've noticed that the rides that I have that are like the amazing rides, those are the ones where I didn't have any thoughts of good enough. I just was there, I was just in the moment. I was enjoying it. I was in joy. I did stuff. Some stuff worked out the way I wanted. Some stuff didn't, didn't matter. I just adjusted and went on. As soon as we imagine what someone else is thinking, judge it as not good enough, doubt ourselves, that creates this barrier. It creates a hesitation. And that it's the hesitation that stops us from responding in the appropriate way at the appropriate time, right? You feel something from your horse, yes. Or whoop, I need a little more, whoop, don't do that, whoop, yes. You know, that's what the conversation needs to be like in this moment. And often when I'm, when I'm helping a student and I see them miss a moment, for example, they've been trying to do something and then all of a sudden I see like, oh, there it is. Oh my gosh. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there it is. That looks amazing. And I don't see the student change anything. I don't see them smile. I don't see them rub their horse. I don't see them get excited. If I ask them, that student in that situation, the most common answer I'll get, you know, if I go, did you feel that? Like, tell your horse that was amazing. Like, why, you know, why aren't you patting your horse? Um, they'll say something like, well, I wasn't sure. Like, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was right. And I get it. You know, there's things to think about. There's stuff to learn. We, while we're students, that, you know, we're not going to have, I think that's the thing is we're never going to know absolutely, <laughs> you know, your horse could always be more collected. It could always be more supple. <laughs> There's always going to be something else to do. But in that moment where you're picturing something, you're talking to your horse, your horse answers the question somehow, what feedback are you going to give them? And that has to be flowing. There can't be stopping and thinking and wondering. Because then you're going to miss, you're going to be praising, you know, 10 strides after it happened, or you're going to be correcting 10 strides after it happened either way. The horse is like, all right, you asked, I did it. How did I do? Did I do it? Is that what you wanted? That's all the horses want to know. <laughs> is that what you wanted? <laughs> Yeah. But you know, the horse world is so traditional, so traditional. Now it's changing a bit with the help of the internet. But there's always this pressure to fit in the system. So what we know now, you know, through the internet is we're really fully aware that there's lots of different systems out there. Lots of different systems. I mean, think of every dis different discipline of riding, every kind of style of jumping, endurance, reining, Western, gated, you know, you name it. You, that's a long list. And then within each, think of just dressage. There's French and German and classical, and then the other kind of classical, and the other kind of classical, because everybody calls themselves classical. Then there's, you know, dressage naturally, and there's natural dressage and Western dressage and cowboy dressage. <laughs> so there's a long list of those kinds of dressage. Then pick one of those. And there's how many different instructors out there? 
and they all have their dis different system. So which one's right? You know, we're, we're driving ourselves crazy on our horse going, am I doing it right? Well, right according to who? <laughs> right? So, you know, when I tell you, oh, there's a million different systems, hopefully that's not, you know, creating like, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to figure this out. I want you to hear that information and feel, feel a little free, you know, because if you just got yelled at for using your inside leg instead of your outside leg in a canter depart, well, guess what? <laughs> Go down the road a bit. You'll find a dressage trainer that tells you to use your inside leg in a transition. And how can this even be? Well, because there's a lot of different horses <laughs> and they're different and everybody is different. So they're all right. They're all wrong. We need to get over ourselves and stop trying to fit into a mold and then driving ourselves crazy because we're not fitting. So what our horses really want is for us to just act naturally around them, to be with them in this moment and this moment and this moment and this moment and this moment. And this moment. <laughs> we have to stay there with them. They want us to be authentic. So this is where it's time to buck tradition. Yes, that was a B in front of that word. Buck tradition and be more you. And that's really what the naturally part of dressage naturally is. Now, I admit when I named my program dressage naturally, I just, you know, wasn't that creative. And I went, well, I do dressage and I do this thing called natural horsemanship. Why don't we put those two words together? Uh, so, you know, it works, but when you really look at how I teach and what I focus on, and as I learn more and more about myself and what I really do, that it's this piece, it's this authentic dropping into the moment, feeling relationship with your horse, where there aren't that many rules. The rule is be your best self, notice the cause and effect, be aware and be in relationship. And in order to do that, we have to get rid of the stuff that's preventing us from being that natural, free flowing, seeing what's happening in the moment, feeling what's happening in the moment. It's about being our natural selves and our best selves. But you know what? It's not easy to be ourselves <laughs> as a human. Gosh, anybody else here just like look at your cat or your dog and just go, what must it be like to just be like them? They just do stuff. I don't think my cat at the end of the day, like plays back the day five times over in her head, wondering how she could have done it better. <laughs> She's like, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. I think I'll walk over there. I think I'll walk back in again. <laughs> so human brains don't work like that. Fortunately and unfortunately, maybe we worry too much about our own judgments. We worry about what other might people might think. We worry about something that happened 20 years ago. We worry about what might happen tomorrow. So if we want success with horses and life and kind of everything, we need to be good communicators. We need to be good communicators with other people, with our horses, and, you know, maybe start with yourself. <laughs> Sometimes the worst conversations I ever have are with myself. Not so much anymore. They, they get better. <laughs> Anyway, to have good communication, we need to be real, authentic, and we have to have an exchange of energy, not just an exchange of stories, and I tell you this stuff, and then that reminds me of something about me, so I tell you about my stuff, and then that reminds me about your stuff, and then you talk about your stuff, and then I talk about my stuff. And we're all living in the past, exchanging memories. 
So to, to practice being a real authentic communicator in a good relationship, we need to exchange energy in the moment and not just draw upon ideas and thoughts and thinking and memories and future dreams. I hope this is making sense. And the main thing that we need to do, especially with our horses, well, no, with everybody, horses life, you can't separate it. We need to realize that every single human is different and every horse is different. And then every human horse combination is different. Think of how many combinations. And the more we try to fit in a mold, the harder it is because everybody really is different. So the more, you know, I have a system, I don't have a system, I have a blueprint. I have some ideas. And most of the way I teach is around being creative and being experimenting and knowing what you're looking for and then dropping it in the moment so you can feel when it happens. You know, I give you some possibilities to play with. That's what my techniques are. Possibilities to play with so you can find the thing. Everybody's different. I can't, um, it's like the treasure map. I, I can't, um, you know, I can't tell you, I, I can't give you the treasure, but I can show you where to dig. I think there's a, there's a quote, something like that. <laughs> and our horses don't care about our credentials. They don't care what you won and how many other horses you trained. They care what's happening right here, right now with you. And in my experience, I feel like I've made the biggest breakthroughs with myself and my horses or with students, um, not so much by teaching them a new advanced technique, but from continually dropping deeper into the simple exercises, right? So that's not unusual, you know, it's all about the basics. Um, but it's, it's like a, the more you can get beyond technique and feel and feel and feel and drop in and be more and more aware about really small things, that those are usually the doorways to allowing an advanced technique to come along. And um, if you don't do that and you just kind of stack uh, surface level techniques and then stack more and more techniques on top of that, you, you can be successful if you're lucky and you have the right horse. But chances are at some point in your life, you're going to need to get experiment, experimentative, <laughs> experimental. <laughs> There's the word. <laughs> you're going to have to get experimental and experimenting is going to then go back and involve feel and curiosity and a greater awareness. So there it is, that greater awareness and feel. You might as well practice that from the beginning. So really making progress is more about listening and observing. And again, reading the moment, reading what's going on in the moment and responding immediately, appropriately, naturally. And when you're free of judgment and brace and you're confident in yourself enough to go, I don't know. I don't know if I'm right or wrong according to whoever Joe Schmo's system, but this is what I'm feeling now. And I said this and my horse did this and I'm adjusting this way. That's the magic. And no matter how experienced or not experienced you are, if you do that, you'll have some success. And no matter how experienced you are, if you're paralyzed by doubt, every move you make, or even if you're just hesitant, missing the moment, you're not going to have as much success. So in the end, the harmony that we see when we watch horses and riders that we admire, it's not coming from a rider pretending to be a cartoon of a horseman or trying to make the horse into a cartoon of a well-trained horse. When we see harmony between a horse and a rider, what we're seeing is the harmony of the relationship, right? Because there's that certain magic something that goes beyond the system that they're using 
you know, with some exceptions, <laughs> um, or the discipline, right? I can appreciate the beauty of a reigning horse, even if I don't do reigning. I can appreciate a beautiful, harmonious moment with a endurance horse, even if I don't do endurance. If the relationship between the horse and the rider is harmonious, then it's beautiful. And that's where I have so much trouble when, you know, critiquing riders that I just see out of the blue, you know, on a video and people start criticizing it's right or it's wrong. I'm like, but the horse understands <laughs> and they're flowing together, you know, I digress. <sighs> so this is what I see my job is as a teacher. It's to help riders see themselves through their horses learn about what they're aware of and what they're feeling and what their, their, their patterns of response and to find a better way to be in harmony with their horses. So yes, of course, there are certain skill sets, coordinations, physical, you know, uh, skills and techniques needed. And there is a need for healthy discipline. Absolutely. But really the best kept secret is between a rider and a horse. Everyone's an individual and the combinations are limitless. Nobody is like you and your horse. And so this is where it kind of brings my brain to, um, to the horse professionals, to the trainers and to the teachers, because it's all part of the cycle, right? So um, in order to operate in this way, and I'm telling students, just be open and feel and be, be your authentic self. And then you're gonna go take a lesson and your trainer's gonna be like, no, you need to do it this way. <laughs> so I, I feel like I'm not really setting you guys up for success if I just leave it at that. You know, it's all daisies and butterflies and then you're gonna go take a lesson and like, wait a minute. So one of the things that I do is I mentor professionals and I don't, um, I don't tell them what they should be teaching, but I help them with their business part of their horse business. And you're probably going to think, Karen, how are you going to connect these two pieces of information? Because what does business have to do with being free of judgment and brace? Well, hang in there. I, th I think I... I <laughs> I think I can connect these dots. It makes sense in my brain. So just give me a second. One of the most challenging and important pieces that I help professionals with when I mentor them is to help them realize and own and celebrate and talk about the unique value that they bring. It's, you know, I could say I help them find their unique value, but it's really less about finding it because I've, what, in my experience, they already know it. They already know what makes them super special. They're just hiding it. And, and they're often hiding it on purpose. And, you know, I started mentoring professionals because I had seen so many burned out, exhausted instructors and trainers. So I mentor them with a lot of things like, you know, leveraging your business and time management and, you know, all kinds of marketing <laughs> and stuff like that. But really the heart of the burnout was not, you know, how to advertise. It was something deeper. It was a burnout coming from an unsatisfaction of not being able to really express who they were and what they really did because they think they thought they couldn't do it. So in my experience, every instructor, just like I said, everybody's a unique individual, right? So every instructor is unique. Every instructor has a special way to teach, a special way to train. They have an eclectic, varied, completely unique, not like anybody else, life experience, as do we all. Yet, most professionals I know try to be a cartoon of the instructor 
in their discipline. So when we, when I first start working with them, you know, what do you do? I'm a dressage trainer. I'm a hunter jumper trainer. Okay. <laughs> well, remember what I said earlier? Oh, what kind of dressage? French, German, Dutch, classical, classical or classical, cowboy, Western, like, <laughs> you know, what is it? But they'll still often say, you know, dressage training. So right away, they try to like put themselves in the most general box possible. And then they try to fit in that box. This is what dressage trainers do. And then that's a lot of pressure because now you got to fit, you got to fit the cartoon and fit the script that goes along with what, a, what is a dressage uh, trainer and what do they do? And already you're limiting yourself. And they start to discount the other parts of themselves when it comes to their special perspective or their special experience or maybe other training they had completely unrelated. Maybe they're a biologist, maybe they're a mathematician and they're just like really, it brings in another element that they don't even tell people about. Sometimes it's because they don't even know that it's important or they, they don't even know that they're using it. It's so second nature, or they might be worried about what other people are going to think of them. And the tendency when professionals um, advertise is to go again, as wide as possible. I'm a dressage trainer. Anybody who wants to do dressage, come on over here, everybody, everybody. <laughs> and then I hate to tell you, but when I get together with other trainers, that haven't gone through the training that I do, most of the time when trainers get together, they complain about their clients. Hopefully I didn't just share a secret, but it's true. So we don't want that. Everybody, everybody should be in a, an adoring relationship. That's my idea in life. Everybody should, should be able to be in an, in an adoring relationship. So figure out how to do that. So how do we, you know, how do we break past this, this problem of teachers trying to fit into a box, students trying to fit in the box that the teacher gave them, and trainers trying to fit horses in boxes, and everybody's working really hard to fit themselves in these little boxes, and their hearts are closing, or shriveling up, or fading, or going, hey, hello, <laughs> I have kind of a new idea, shh dressage writers don't do that. <laughs> and because of that, in the horse world, often the like magic combinations of, oh my gosh, I've got the right horse and the right student with the right teacher. And it's just magical. And it feels like this random act of the universe, the stars aligned. But you know what? It doesn't actually have to be random. There's things that we are all doing that attracts exactly what is going on in our lives. You know, I don't believe that completely, you know, stuff happens. We don't have that much power. Stuff is happening, but we have choices. We have choices on how, what we're going to keep, what we're going to move away from, what we're going to actively go seek more of. <laughs> So when I love when I teach this part to professionals, because they, at first they just kind of stare at me. <laughs> and then I feel this like collective sigh of relief because it's like the letting go of the burden of trying to be something they're not. And this applies to everybody. I'm talking about professionals right now, but it, it applies to all of us. We all do this as humans. We keep trying to be something we're not because it must be better to be not me. I got to be like something else to make me good enough. No, <laughs> you are fine just the way you are. So there's this like letting go of trying to be what they think they should be. And now they're free to be what they want to be. And that creates a joy and a passion that's contagious. It's contagious to the horses. It's contagious to the students. It's contagious to anybody they meet. 
So it's about trying to figure out, well, here's what they do. They, they call themselves a dressage trainer and then they just hope that they get one of those magic students with the magic horse that they love to teach. And they hope they get one of those. So I guess my point is we can all be magicians. We can all make that happen. We don't just have to sit there and hope. So what I do when I, when I mentor professionals is I help them see the special value that they bring that is so obvious to everybody around them, but they can't see it themselves. So a lot of you guys out there might have a special trainer and you know, and you feel like it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm so lucky to have found this person. She's a dressage trainer or a hunter jumper trainer, or whatever it is, but you feel like, how lucky am I that I found this person? It's like my little secret, <laughs> secret special thing. And you want her all to yourself or him. So what is it? Why is that teacher better to, for you than the other one down the block? Because guess what? The other one down the block that you can't stand has somebody else that thinks that they're like, oh my gosh, the luckiest person in the world to have them. Neither one is better or worse, but you're, you're good for different people. And that's one of the hardest things for us to see in ourselves. You can't see what your own value is. You need, it's like the nose on your face, right? Everybody else can see it, but you can't see your own nose. So this is what I help people do. And this is what I, one of the first and most important things that I teach in the, for the Love of the Horse Transform Your Business seminars. And I have a man, mastermind and mentorship program where we take, you know, six months to work this out because <laughs> it's a process. For those of you listening, when this podcast first comes out, uh, my next two-day seminar, which is virtual this year, which is super cool because you don't have to travel, is uh, February 16 and 17. And then the next six-month mastermind starts in March. You can get to all of the information about this if you go to dressagenaturally.net slash professionals. And you'll see information about the mastermind and the seminar. So don't miss the seminar. That's coming up really quick. February 16 and 17. Check it out. And you can get tickets through that website. Dressagenaturally.net slash professionals. Okay. Now I want to give you just an example from one, one person that I mentored that still just blows me away. Because she's just... <laughs> She's such an inspiration for me, actually. And it's, it was a woman, when she first um, came to the Transform Your Business seminar and then did the mastermind with me, she was already like 70. And she had this really amazing eclectic background. She's a dressage trainer, upper level rider. Um, she also uh, does clicker training. I'm, and very credentialed in, in clicker training and animal behavior. She also had spent like seven years studying with a, a Zen, Zen kind of Zen meditation. Um, just really, really cool. And um, she was um, having some health issues, some family tensions, some chronic insomnia for like 20 years. And she was in the program. And one of the first exercises that we do you know, working through this process of trying to figure out, you know, what do you do? No, but what do you really do? Like getting to that authentic self, the real, the real joy, the real passion, the real person underneath all the stuff that life had piled on top. And she kept saying, you know, well, I teach dressage and, you know, I want to connect it with clicker training and, you know, I mean, I do this and we kept kind of, but what do you really do? And why do you do that? And why do you do that? And we kind of dug a little deeper and finally kind of in a outburst, she, and I, I'm not gonna be able to re recreate what she said, because it was such an inspired moment, but she was kind of like, I just want to, you know, change the world by showing people how to be mindful with their horses and bring joy. And just, it was just like, blah, this amazing, beautiful thing. We all just sat there with our jaw on the ground. And we are just like, 
that was so real. That was so from her heart. And then she went, but I can't tell people I do that. <laughs> and we all just started laugh, laughing, not at her, but it was like that just uh, what um, Benjamin Zander calls cosmic laughter. It was just like, oh my gosh, like there it was. She finally spoke from the heart, finally was like, this is me. And she put herself out there, took a beat and was like, but I can't do that. Yes, you can. You, you, you must. <laughs> so since then, her insomnia was cured. Her family dynamics changed. Her family is so supportive. Um, she launched uh, her new website. She created a course and she was invited to speak at an international animal behavior conference. And this is like age, starting at age 70. Yes, that was her. That was her getting out of the box, getting rid of the judgment, opening her heart and not being afraid to be like, this is who I am and this is what I do. And it doesn't fit in a system. She made her own box <laughs> and hopefully it's not a box. She just made her own place to live that busted out of the boxes of what she should be doing. I know I had the biggest breakthrough in my career when I was also ready to quit, when I couldn't hold myself in the box any longer, I was like, enough. And I know I've talked about this before. And I just said, forget it. I'm stopping everything. And then I said, well, now that I've stopped, I can do whatever I want. And then I started doing what I wanted and started studying what I wanted to study and doing it the way I wanted to do and riding around bareback in a dressage facility <laughs> with a halter on. And people told me I was weird and people told me I was wrong. And you know what? I didn't care because it felt so real. It was right for me. So students, I haven't forgotten about you guys. <laughs> See if you can look past your level of education as a student and really just feel the exchange of energy happening between you and your horse, you and your horse, not the cartoon of what you think a student should be. I've met students who, quote, did everything wrong compared to the instructions that come with the box of the action figure of a dressage rider. They had funny little horses and they did weird stuff with them, but they had this really special relationship with them and they were joyous and they, they achieved more than I ever imagined that they would back then. Now I know not to doubt people like that. Some of my proudest achievements were with horses where they had three strikes against them in some way and I had to do it differently. I had to listen to them. I had to throw out the rule book and do what they needed. And then they came back and I ended up achieving more than I had originally expected from them when they were like 100% sound or healthy or whatever it was that was <laughs> going wrong. So why wait for that? Why wait until, you know, your horse is lame or something, and then you have to do something differently? Why wait until you're burned out and then you have to throw it all away and start over? So I, I don't want you to have to do that. It's not fun. It's not fun to wait too long and then go, why didn't I think about this sooner? It's not fun to get burned out, especially if you're in the horse business, because like you love horses. And when you get burned out in the horse business, you lose your job, you lose your passion, you lose your hobby. That's not nice. I can tell you, it doesn't feel good. So let's approach ourselves, every single horse, every single student with this openness of like, I wonder who you are and how I can relate to you. So it's about finding everyone's superpower. Every one of you has a superpower. Every horse has a superpower. Like Ovation has a superpower for like putting stuff in his mouth <laughs> and lots of other stuff. But it was my acknowledgement of his superpower for putting things in his mouth that created a relationship that now he schools Grand Prix with me. And I can draw a direct line of connection between those two things. Find your superpower. Find what makes them joyous. Find what makes you joyous. Find what makes everyone joyous and like go there and then on from there. That's your starting place.
So much of writing comes from military. It comes from men in the military. <laughs> Nothing wrong with men. And I know we need an army. But we don't, we, we don't need to do that in our horses anymore. We can shed the military stuff. We can shed the dominant stuff. It just doesn't work for many people. And yes, there's a need for healthy discipline and consistent practice. But that doesn't mean we have to treat every lesson like a military maneuver where submissive and obedience are valued over communication and relationship and individual opinions. <laughs> relationship is everything. You can't have a good relationship unless you know yourself and you are being yourself. So become the best version of yourself. Becoming the best version of yourself is your life's work. But here's how I see it. You already are what you have yet to become. You just have to get rid of the garbage that life has put on you. So there's a great quote, probably you've heard this um, from Michelangelo, who's, you know, sculpted these amazing, intricate, huge statues out of marble, right? And he said, the sculptor is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It's already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. So you already are what you have yet to become. Just get rid of the superfluous material. <laughs> I had a I had a conversation with an actor once, not like a Hollywood actor, but an actor. And he once said that acting helped him feel more authentic, which initially might seem weird. Like, how can you be your authentic self by pretending to be someone else? That that doesn't seem like it should make sense. But he said it was because because he got to practice being different. He got to practice being different people. And so in doing that, he realized that he got to choose and it helped him see his patterns, his life patterns. You know, there's who you are and there's what you do all day and your normal habitual responses and answers and word choices and stuff like that. So by being an actor, he got to like try new ways of being on for size. It expanded his range. And in doing that, he realized that his own habitual patterns were just no different than this character in this play habitual patterns. None of it was him. None of it was him. He was something else deeper than that. So sometimes when I teach, I actually do recommend that people pretend to be someone else. And, you know, I was thinking about that as I was talking about the, you know, writing up the notes for this podcast. I'm like, wait, but I'm saying be your authentic self. But I just said, told someone yesterday to pretend to be someone, <laughs> to pretend to be a different person. But this is where it connects. By, if you're having trouble breaking your own patterns, one of the easiest ways to do it is just to consciously try on for size someone else's patterns. Don't, not because they're better and you're not good enough, but just go, huh, wonder what it's like to be like that. Wonder what it's like to be like that. <laughs> you know? And separate yourself. It's not you. There's you and there's the stuff you do all day. Two different things. So, you know, in your, if you've listening to this and you're like, huh, I think I, I wonder who I am. You know, think of trying different ways to be. If you try different ways to be, then you're going to, you're going to get past the superficial and you'll realize who's left over. Who's the one watching you be these different people. And if anybody here, I highly recommend um, Michael Singer, oh, Untethered Soul and the Surrender Project. Surrender Experiment, Michael Singer, really recommend him. And he's got like an online course, I think, with Sounds True. He's got the books. Um, but he talks a lot about that. He's like, you're not you. Like, you're the, who's, if you're like 
having anger or frustration, he'll say, well, how do you know you're angry and frustrated? And the answer is because I'm in there. <laughs> the real you is the one who's noticing yourself getting angry and frustrated. You're not the anger and the frustration. You're the one who's quietly noticing yourself act that way. So when I'm saying like, try someone else on for size, you're staying in there and just observe yourself going, oh, now I'm doing it this way. Now I'm doing it that way. Look at me changing the channels on the TV. Anyway, is that making sense? Oh, so I guess the point is, you know, this, you know, I love paradoxes, this paradox of can we be free and open and individual and break free the boxes and still have goals and standards, right? Goals and standards and achieve high levels and even compete. Yes, absolutely. What I'm talking about here is the way to travel on the road to your goals. It's not the goal itself. It's not, you know, I mean, well, being like this is a great goal. Just be like this. But, you know, probably you're going somewhere. Probably you have a destination. And it's more about how are you going to be on that road that you're on? You can still get somewhere. You can still have high standards. You can still have, you know, great achievements. But the more you know and value what makes you unique, the more you understand that, the more tools you're going to have readily available because you're not going to be limited by what you think you should be doing or what you should be feeling. Here's the thing. You have been practicing being you your whole life. You've been you your whole life with some maybe superfluous material stacked on top. But it's time to unapologetically let the world meet you. Let your horse feel you. And professionals, let your students understand that what you are about and all that you've learned. You're an educator. You're there to share perspective. Don't hold some of your perspectives back. That's the ones the students that you have that make that connection, they're already feeling that. So take your most magical favorite students and figure out what are they seeing in you and, and help others see that too. So you get more of those. So my last questions for you are, what are you trying to be that you're not? Whether you're a student, just a rider, trainer, what are you trying to be that you kind of know you're not? And question number two, where are you hesitating because you're not sure if you're right? And that could be moments during a ride or it could be in taking a big, bold step in your life making a decision that you know you want to do and you're just not doing it. Something's holding you back. So where are you hesitating? Because you're not sure if you're right. I don't know what the answer is, but I can show you where to dig. <laughs> dig there. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that and, get, and it gives you lots to think about. And if you are a professional, Join me and transform your business for the love of the horse. It's virtual this year. It's usually in person. You have to get on like an airplane and travel to Florida. This year, it's virtual. We've got people from all over the world attending. I hope this pandemic ends and we can go back to in-person again. So jump on this. You just have to sit there for two days and learn and be open. It's interactive. It's not just a webinar. We're going to be talking with each other and answering questions and talking amongst yourselves and doing worksheets and participating. And there's a guest speaker with about time management. Anyway, I hope you join me. Dressagenaturally.net slash professionals. And 
if you enjoyed this podcast, pop over to uh, the Dressage Naturally Land Facebook group and share your thoughts on the subject. I'd love to hear what you think. All right. Thank you.